speaks another language, doesn't it? Thanks, guys, for uh, blessing us this morning. And there's more to come this, this uh, holiday season. With, we celebrate Christmas. Next week, our kids are going to be, they're not quite as uh, polished, <laughs> but they're, they're pretty special, too. Yeah. See you next week. Well, we are, we, I mean, the room says it, the music says it, I'm, I'm looking, for the, looking for the Christmas on your outfit. Not, you don't yet say it, we're still kind of getting there, I guess, with our red. I, I wore my red today trying to spruce up Christmas, but we're actually going to, instead of jumping into uh, our Advent series, which will start next week, I felt it's really important to conclude the series that we started really four weeks ago. I always hate to leave a series unfinished. And uh, the reality is, is that really what we're talking about throughout this entire book of Romans, and in a big way today, and don't miss this fact, today what we're talking about today is very much connected to the Incarnation. It is the reason that Christ came. That's what we're talking about with this whole conversation that we started four weeks ago about relationship status, dot, 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 changed. And I started out with that conversation back three, four weeks ago, actually four or five weeks ago, where I shared with you about my uh, wedding day with my wife and our Facebook posts, and I got to change my status on there on our honeymoon to married as opposed to, you know, dating somebody. Relationship status had changed. What's interesting about relationships as you jump into them, if you've, if you've had one, now I'm guessing most of the room has been in a romantic relationship of some sort. If you haven't, then I'll tell you a little bit about what's to come. Uh, but what's entailed in those is something called a DTR. Now, I used that, that acronym many, many months ago, and you all scratched your head when I said it. You know, what does that mean? And it means define the relationship. We got to have a DTR right now because we got to define this relationship. What are we? Where are we going? How do I respond to you? What are my expectations of what's going on here? We got to have a DTR. Now, these can be exciting if you're about to propose. It's an exciting DTR to have, right? You're assuming they'll say yes, but there's much wrapped up in that. Uh, if you are, if you know, when I was in, in college and I dated my first girl, having that first DTR was quite a thrill. Your heart was racing for days before you had that because you are literally planning every single word that you're about to say to that person, hoping they'll respond. Uh, but they can also be hard, right? I mean, when you are in the a certain kind of relationship with somebody, and the nature of that is going to change to being less of a relationship. When the person comes to you and says, hey, I know that we've been dating, we've been experiencing doing life together here, so forth, but we're going to end that now. It's not so, so fun to hear. And it can be a challenging thing to have that conversation, but they're important nonetheless, right? Because the problem with not having that conversation, the person thinking that you are intending something that you're not, You'll have inconsistencies in your life. You will have said something in the past in which will still be binding in some ways today, and yet your life will not reflect that. You will start to maybe avoid the person trying to, you know, give them the hints or whatnot, and they'll feel like you're being very inconsistent with your life. You say one thing, and you're doing something different. So those DTRs help to bring into alignment what you have said and what you are doing, and there's clarity on it. So it avoids inconsistencies, it, it allows you to have right expectations of what's going forward, and, uh, and this is a really important conversation that the church, I think, needs to have with what's called the Old Testament. This, this side of our Bibles, right, when you, when you open up your Bibles, you have two sides, the Old Covenant, New, Old Testament, and the New Covenant, New Testament, and we all know how that divides, you've been in the church any length of time, and the question that we struggle with a lot is, how do they relate? What's the nature of that relationship? And what is my relationship to this other side of the Bible over here? I mean, I read it, and it says, great, but, but what's my relationship to it? Now, there's all kinds of questions that really come out of that. Some of those questions deal with, what's my relationship to, let's say, the Sabbath? Now, there's some Christians out there who say that you need to keep the Sabbath on Saturday, and if you don't, then that's violation of God's law. Now, they probably would not say you had to be stoned to death, right? But nonetheless, it's still binding on us, binding on us today. Or other ones, maybe a dietary lies. Like we read about not eating pork. There are some groups of Christianity. And, and this is no way saying that shame on them. This is not what that's intended to do. But it's just identifying that there is differences and in, in how we relate to what's being said in the Old Testament. In which some would say that you cannot eat pork anymore 
at all today because that was something God forbid in the Old Testament and, and, and now you, you shouldn't eat. In fact, uh, there's even a college nearby that that's kind of the, the tenet that they run on. Now, if you're going down that path there, you talk about dietary laws, even clothing laws, you're probably thinking to yourself also, well, well, let's talk about what people bring up about inconsistencies and maybe what about the topic of homosexuality? I mean, that one kind of gets a lot of press these days, doesn't it? And doesn't, isn't the kind of the press, the pundits and the, the, the people, the, the journalists who are bringing this out there saying, you're being very inconsistent in how you apply the scriptures. Because in the same book where it talks about the abomination of this homoerotic activity, it also says that eating shellfish and eating pork and dressed in certain ways, I mean, it, it, it abolishes those as well. So you're being very inconsistent. So in all this discussion, it's really as helpful for us and important for us to have a DTR with that side of the Bible, especially with that part of the Bible known as the Mosaic Law, which is where we get all these from. Now, this DTR has been going on for a long time in the church. The church has been having DTRs with this topic for a long time. It started back in the very inception when Christ came on the scene, Pentecost happened, you had the Holy Spirit go out, right? And from that day, there was questions. You see them surface as Paul goes out in his missionary journey. You see the church in Acts chapter 15 have this big council to decide what is our relationship to all those laws of Moses, that was a big question. No, no, we're not there yet. I'll let you know. I usually say number one in your notes. That's your cue. By the way, good time to pull out those notepads, though, because you might want to write some things down along the way. But Acts chapter 15, that drew some counsel. They're talking about what the relationship is. Let's have a DTR. We've got to figure this out. Acts chapter 18, Paul is getting persecuted because they're claiming the Judaizers, those who believe they're Christians as well as have to obey the Old Testament law, are trying to tell people they have to become Jews before they can become Christians. Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 21. In fact, this is the very issue that got Paul arrested in Jerusalem and got shipped off to Rome. The very end of the book of Acts. And this is a, this is a topic that has, that has been a part of the church for a while. And Paul spent a lot of time addressing it because it's such a big issue in churches. The book of Galatians is a great book in which Paul is really trying to clarify the relationship a Christian has with the Mosaic law specifically, but really the, the broader spectrum of the Old Testament. The book of Colossians draws on this as well, as well as Hebrews parsing out the entirety, you might say, of the ceremonial system of the Old Testament or Mosaic law and showing Christ in the midst of that. I mean, those books are all about this issue of having a DTR about our relationship to the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law. The book of Romans also goes down this path in a big way. In fact, it was started off in chapter 6. If you're not there with me, turn to Romans chapter, well, 7. We're going to be in 6 really quickly. But in this series about status change, we talk about our status to death has been changed, our status to sin has been changed, right? Our relationship has entirely changed. And with that, there was a, a human experience that was given to us, or a human governance given to humanity called the Mosaic Law because human beings were sinful. And because now of our relational status has changed, relation to those other two things, Paul doesn't say it's changed in respect to relationship to the law as well. Now, in chapter 6, you'll notice in verse 15, he says, after this conversation about your sin and death being changed in relationship to them, he says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? And then he kind of leaves you hanging. I mean, we had a whole week of conversation without talking about the law. That was our last message. Now he brings up, well, what do you mean I'm not under law anymore? What does that look like? What does it look like to be under grace, and how do those two relate I mean, isn't every word of God, God breathed, the Old Testament God spoke? Well, was that not binding on them either? What's this relationship like? Well, in chapter 7, Paul starts to lay out the DTR, the nature of that relationship. And in chapter 7, verse 1, I hope you're in that area now. This is where we pick up. Paul says, do you not know, brothers? Now, he's speaking to a specific group in the church in Rome. There's Jews and there's Gentiles there. And now he's speaking to those, as he says, those brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law. Basically, to the Jews here. Those of you who hold in high regard and have a rich history with that side of your scriptures. And really, at that time, there's only one side of the scriptures. It wasn't two sides at the time he wrote this book. So, who had a good grasp on the Mosaic law. 
He says that the law, the Mosaic law, is binding on a person only as long as he lives. And now he's going to use an analogy. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband. Now let me just pause there, just make a little statement. He wants to show the nature of a relationship of a woman to her husband, but then also to other men around. And the word he uses here for marriage is actually the only place in all the Bible he uses this word for marriage. It literally means under husband or under man. An under man woman is bound to her husband. Now, no other place in the, in the New Testament is that word used, but he uses it here because it makes a specific point in where we're driving to, being under law or under grace. He says an under man woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. And this is all drawn from the Mosaic law. He's saying this is what you already know. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of husband or of marriage. There's the word husband there, the law of husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Now, that's not a good word. We know adultery, adulteress, that's, that's not a positive word in the God's vocabulary, right? In fact, there's instances and there's, there's even a, a command if you commit adultery to be stoned. I mean, that's, that's not something you want to toy with, right? So she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while his, her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Okay, so basically going back to the statement that death severs relationship, right? That's the basic, especially with the law. If you, you are bound to it as long as you are living, but if you die, you're no longer bound to it. He's showing it with an analogy here. And so he concludes saying, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. To him who has been raised from the dead, there is that new relationship in order that we might bear fruit to God. Now, usually I have like three points for these messages. Today I have two, so you're lucky. And let's just use this first point just to kind of summarize the basic point of what Paul is saying here. And that's this. Number one, you saw it before, a little teaser. Here it is. Write it down. You need to be very, very clear about the nature of our relationship to the Mosaic Law. We have got to be crystal clear. Because if we're not clear, we are in danger of inconsistencies, We're in danger even, as Paul uses this analogy here, of committing spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. This is why Paul uses strong language in the book of Galatians when he talks about the relationship to the law. This is why in Romans he uses this analogy, and it's a very apt analogy actually. Because when you think about the giving of the law, your mind goes back to Acts, I'm sorry, Acts, goes back to Exodus chapter 19. In fact, you might want to turn there in your Bibles, because we'll get there in a second. But in Acts chapter 19 records the beginning of God giving Israel the law, the Mosaic law. And you remember the scene there? They're the base of Mount Sinai. In fact, turn back there if you're not already doing so. Turn back to Acts 19. They're the base of Mount Sinai. They've come out of Egypt, walked through the Red Sea. They are a a new, redeemed, free people, right? He brings them to the mountain. They're camped out around it for a little bit of time. And God comes to Moses, and he says this. Go to Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse, well, verse 4. God says to Moses to say to the people, You yourselves have seen what I did. To the Egyptians. Oh yeah, we all saw that. It was pretty incredible. Ten plagues, one being the Passover, all the firstborn died. Now this, Jewish historians kind of argue, assume, in the range of 50-ish, 60-ish days earlier. That's that's how much time has passed. It's still kind of up in the air. You know, no one really knows for sure, but that's, we'll kind of give it that broad spectrum of what they're thinking of how much has passed between the Passover and now the Sinai experience. You yourselves saw what I did to Egyptians and how I bore you on uh, eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel, God says to Moses. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set them before all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will 
do. Now notice what's being said there. We will do it. Does that sound somewhat familiar to an experience you've had in your life if you've been married? I know my wedding day, and I've officiated many weddings, so I've said this to somebody else, but you basically say, do you take so-and-so? I do, right? And then what do you do? You go into these vows of what you promise to do with that statement of I do, right? I will love, I will keep you, I will protect you, right? If you're a guy, you know, maybe your vows are different than girls, but you go in, this is what that vow, that I will, or I will do that, I do statement entails, the vows, that's, that's the covenant, that's the Mosaic law. This is what you are covenanting to. We will do that. This here was a marriage ceremony between God and the people of Israel. And so much so, look at what the way it's described in verse 16. Verse 16, on the morning of the third day, some time had passed, they purified themselves. They got ready, they got their bridal gown on, right? You ladies know about three days preparing for a wedding. Guys, it's more like three hours preparing for the wedding. But uh, you ladies will get this, three days preparing for this wedding, get yourself adorned and sanctified and go into the, the spas and get your nails done and just you're exfoliated and everything is off you that has ever been dirty, right? You are clean. On the third day, when they're all clean, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud. Sounds like a procession fit for a good wedding. On the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast so that the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Okay, picture that, right? Picture the wedding ceremony, father bringing her, his daughter down to present to the husband. Here's Moses bringing the people out to meet God, whom they are to be connected to, bound to, covenanted to. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. That'd be a pretty awesome sight. Like a big candle. Roman candle is nothing compared to the Mount Sinai on fire. That would be a pretty awesome experience with this canopy this canopy of clouds surrounding it. So no sunlight's coming in, no light's coming in, but the fire is illuminating the environment around them, and that's all that they're experiencing. And the sound of the trumpets grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on, key phrase, Mount Sinai, not all the way down to the people. He stopped to the top. Came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went. So this picture was the wedding day of Israel to the Lord, we might say. And the mediator between that wedding, the, the I will, the I do, the vows, right, was the Mosaic law that God commands them. Now the people of Israel saw this significance, so in their culture, they built into their culture on wedding days, they had something called a hoopah. Anyone here Jewish or had been to a, hoop, a Jewish wedding? Hoopah, Right? C-H-U-P-P-A-H, if you want to put English letters to it all. The hoopah was this canopy that married couples kind of got married underneath, and it was a reflection. Now, they'll say it's really the wedding chamber in which that, that, that the husband calls the wife into, but really what it was also was the chamber God called his people into. And it's symbolic of the cloud canopy that was covering the people of Israel, God's presence hovering over them, watching over them, purifying them, calling them into a relationship. And this marriage relationship taking place on this day of this bride and this groom meeting together was a reflection of that marriage relationship that took place in Mount Sinai. Remembering the covenant God had made with them, and this was symbolic of that. So this marriage relationship had great significance, which is why God commanded so many things about the preservation of marriage in the Old Testament. Because in the same way our walk with Christ images that relationship, their relationship with God was imaged by this marriage ceremony. So God gave great protection around that. Now, that experience that day, right, was beautiful. Now fast forward, if you will, uh, 1,500 years to the day of Pentecost. We all have heard of Pentecost, right? Now turn to Acts chapter 2, because this might be really important for you to see as well. Acts chapter 2. Because it says in the very beginning of verse 2, these words, and now you'll get there and you'll read them in a second, but when the day of Pentecost came, meaning that there was a day on their calendar, that they were anticipating it coming, what was the day of Pentecost? The day of Pentecost, 
Pentecost is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Shavuot. And it was the Feast of Pentecost they're waiting for, or the Feast of Shavuot. What is the Feast of Shavuot? The Feast of Shavuot was 50 days after uh, the Passover feast. God instituted this Feast of Weeks. Now, Shavuot means weeks, plural, or a week's worth of weeks. That's 49 days. And after the 49 days are complete, you would celebrate the Feast of Shavuot. On that day, you were celebrating basically the wheat harvest, how God's prosperity yet again had been shown to his people and they will have plentiful bounty harvest that year. And they would bring to the Lord a wave offering of first fruits of their bread and wheat and whatever else they had there to the Lord's presence in celebration. Because when God provides prosperity, people celebrate. And that's what he's calling them to, right? Well, as Israel's history went along, we know that they're they're uh, kind of jaded in their experience. And so Israel goes into exile. They, they, they don't follow the commands of the Lord. They reject the vows, we might say. In fact, other, certain places in the scriptures calls it idol, or adultery, right? That language of adultery is coming up often. And they go off into exile. They still continue to follow those, those feasts that God had given them. One being the feast. Now it turns from Shavuot to, pa, or to Pentecost because that's the Greek word for the Hebrew word there. Now, what they start to attach to that, now that's a long explanation, but bear with me, they start to attach to that is because God's prosperity is a result of our faithfulness to the law, our faithfulness to the covenant that we made with him. And when we violate that and disregard that, God pulls back that prosperity and the, the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28 come into effect, the culmination being exile which is what we're experiencing right now. So attached to that feast, they attached to it because the covenant was made roughly 50-ish days or so. So since it was so close, they attached that to the feast, the celebration of the giving of the law of God. Because with the law, obedience, there's prosperity. There's blessing. The Psalms speak often about blesses the man who walks with the Lord, Right? So the day of Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost, had really two things, but really the law became the focal point because that is the means for the prosperity of the Lord. And so we celebrated the harvest, but it meant that the Lord was pleasing to us. The covenant was still not totally gone. And so in Acts chapter 2, they are anticipating 50 days after the Passover, which we all have in our mind's eye, is the feast when Jesus broke the bread of his disciples, he was crucified, right, resurrected, all those things. The Passover, um, the, the, the day of Pentecost was coming. They're waiting, and look at what happens. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven. It didn't happen inside, from the outside in. It didn't come from, from the surrounding streets. It came from heaven, and it was only, notice this, uh, a set, it came from heaven, a sound like a rush, mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house. The neighbors didn't hear it, right? It was just, it filled the house, this, this noise, this rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now let's go back to Sinai. Remember, God came down, rested on the top of Mount Sinai, but he didn't come down to the people. He manifested himself in a pillar of fire that produced this canopy of smoke, right? Now God is coming down all the way to the people and his flame is resting on each one and he's filling them with his spirits. Why the flame? I think it goes back to Sinai. Hey guys, this, this is why the covenant was given to point you to the Spirit. It filled the entire place, divided tongues of fire, appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. God came down, rested inside of them, not because they were anything good, because Jesus had done something miraculous. He lived the righteous life. He died He died in your behalf. He was resurrected from the dead, went to heaven, sent down the Spirit, and now you have opportunity to have God to dwell in you. God with us, Emmanuel, now God dwells in us. An incredible thought. So you have, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. You gotta hear what's going on here. 
The picture, the author is using certain language here to kind of draw you back and remember what took place. That was an important kind of wedding ceremony that God did with Israel. The Spirit of God now comes. He is now consecrating for himself. He is now putting the law of God that was written on stone into their hearts. And I think I passed these two, but go back to the two we want to see, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Remember these, these ones? This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel spoken all throughout the exile period when they were connecting the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of uh, Pentecost with both the prosperity of God and the law of God. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Written to exiles. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 and I will no, go back. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Next slide. And I will put my spirit within you. Connect the dots. You realize this is the writing of his law on the heart and cause you to, to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What's happening here? There's a wedding ceremony taking place. This is why the Spirit is called in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, as a seal. When I got engaged with my wife, I gave her a ring. It was a pretty expensive ring. I'm guessing hopefully you bought fairly expensive rings for your to-be brides as well along the way, right? And it was a seal. It was a promise ring saying, what I'm saying today will be brought to completion and I will bring you into my home. We will be wedded someday. The Spirit of God is given as that wedding ring, as that engagement ring saying, what I have promised to do, I will complete and we're waiting for our groom. But with that also, that marriage, this is also the writing of the law on your hearts. That day changed the nature of our relationship to the written codified law. Because no more will you be uh, having heart to stone and looking at this thing going, gosh, I, that looks so righteous and good, but I just don't do it. I'm deserving of all the penalties that are there. Those who commit adultery, death. Those who curse their parents, death. Those who do unclean, touch a dead body, well, you're, you're removed from the fellowship of God for any length of time. Well, goodness gracious, See, now I'm writing them on your heart. There's something new that transacted. And what's fun about this also, you might recall that in Romans chapter 8, a little bit, we'll get to this in a few months now, but in Romans chapter 8, he calls the Spirit of God the first fruits of those who have been given the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the first fruits, reminding us back to the Feast of Shavuot. Right? And the reason that you have that that joy and that first fruits is because God has written his law in your hearts. The new covenant has moved from outside to inside. You are wedded to Christ. So the nature of your relationship has changed. Changed entirely. Which is why we pick up in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Go back to Romans. We describe that analogy, the marriage analogy. Hear this, hear this. As a Christian, if you have, according to Romans 7, verse 4, he says, you therefore have died to the law through the body of Christ. So if you try to go back and say, well, the law is now binding on me now. The law is still have authority over me. You are in danger of committing adultery, spiritual adultery. So be very, very careful with how you relate to the law. You need to have a very serious DTR with this thing. You, my brothers, have died to the law through the body of Christ. Now, what's the body of Christ referring to? The crucified body of Christ, the one that represented the old man, the one that was born of woman. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Do I have it on the screen here? I do! <laughs> when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, not of man, right? This is why uh, he did not inherit the, the sinful, kind of the in Adam part. Born of a woman, born under law. Christ, the old man, Christ, the one before the resurrection, was under the law. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He obeyed every jot and tittle of that thing. He observed all the feasts. He observed the Sabbath. I mean, he was perfect in the entire completion of it all. He was born. And you know what? Because he was under it, it says because the law had authority over him to some degree. 
the law had a, he put himself under the law. Why? I didn't put it up there. I apologize. Verse five, to redeem those who are under the law. He became like you and I. He became like his people under the, he put himself there to redeem them out of it. And when he died, he died to sin. You and I die in sin if we're not a follower of Christ. He didn't die in sin like all humanity. He died to sin. He also didn't die in the law. Those who are dead and not in Christ still have the burden of the law because they still stand cursed. The law still resides and they will receive punishment from the law. Christ died to the law. And those who are in Christ, Romans chapter 5, die to the law. So you're Relationship has changed so that you might belong to another. Here's a whole wedding, right? You died to the one, the man who was under the law, so that you might live and belong, not just live to, but belong to, wedded to, united to. You are now a woman under man. And your man is Christ. Okay? So, that always gets me distracted. I'm not used to all this, that, that, that conversation that goes on after a statement. This is awesome. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Okay, so, so, so you belong to him. And who is the him? The one who's been raised from the dead. Question for you, is Christ seated at the right hand of God? Is he under the law? Is he observing the Sabbath right now? I mean, oh, it's day of rest, better. God, hello, <laughs> right? I can't perform any more ceremony today, right? Is he, uh, is he worrying about his clothing? Oh, this, this one I got over at the, the two, you know, woven place that has, has two kinds of, of yarn, no, it's, you know, he's, he's not under the law. It has no bearing on him at all, does it? Zero whatsoever. And guess who's hidden with Christ in God? You and I are. You and I are. This is, let me go back. This is why Romans 5, 12 through 21 is, I believe, the most important section of Scripture for understanding our relationship with Christ today. How we're living out the sanctified life. Because if you don't realize the connect, the un union you have with Christ, that God associates, that counts to you, and that let yourself experience that, then you will always be baffled by this relationship. So when we talk about this whole understand our relationship to the law, we have to say, here it is, Paul used the word dead. Let's put it this way. We need to say it has no authority in our relationship with God. Now, I put on the screen, it's not in your notes. Don't worry about that. But it has no authority in our relationship to God anymore. No authority. It's sort of like this. If you want to get a degree, let's say you want to get a science degree or an engineering degree. For me, it was a biochem degree. And say that degree is over here. Guess what stands between you and that degree? A school. Right? You've got to go through a school and do all the classwork required, all the papers, all the tests. Uh, I mean, I even had to do a writing test. If you go to certain schools, there's even a dress code. You've got to wear certain stuff, certain clothing. It's a private school. Some schools will say that you have to have a dietary obligation. Now, to get through all of that, to get to that desired degree, you've got to complete all that coursework right? That now, that school, we might say, because you got to go through that, has authority over you. If you want that degree, if you want to arrive there, they have authority over you. They're going to tell you, here's what you got to do. Here's your list of classes. Oh, and by the way, in those classes, here's your coursework. Here's the books you've got to read. Here's the assignments you got to get. Here's the papers you got to, the research is all you got to do. Oh, and by the way, if you go to a private school, you got to go to chapels, right? You can't dance, you can't drink. I, I mean, there's, there's a few other little things added on there, right? Because if you want to get that degree, here's what you got to go through. They are the mediator. They are an authority over you. As long as you don't have the degree, they hold authority over you. Well, guess what Christ did? Well, you kept flunking out because you just had a hard time with this stuff. Christ went through the program for you. Right? He had perfect dress code, perfect attendance. He got 4.0, and you know what he did for that? He downloaded the entire 4.0, all the A's, into your database. So you go online, you look at, what, what do I got? Oh, I have a 4.0. How'd that happen? How'd I get that? And now what happens when the school comes to you and says, oh, I don't remember you there. Well, just look at my record. 
doesn't matter if you remember. My record says that I was there, right? Why? Because of your union with Christ. He did it for you, right? That's what, no authority. They cannot say, you need to go to class. Here's your coursework. There's nothing like that. It's all done. There's no coursework uh, for you anymore. They have no authority. There's no mediator anymore. Are you hearing me on this? Christ's righteousness, chapter 3, Romans, where it says, a righteousness you did not have, so God sent a righteousness to you. He gave you the righteous requirements of law, put it inside of you. He gave them to you. You are now righteous in his eyes, which means that it has no authority over you anymore. No authority. A great passage for maybe understanding this a bit is maybe Matthew chapter 5. Turn back there to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Matthew 5, 17. If you're a Sabbath school graduate or a, uh, a WANA graduate, this might be familiar territory. Jesus is in the middle of his uh, Sermon on the Mount. It's a very popular one. People like to use these texts. But he has something to say at the very onset of this sermon about the law and really about our relationship to it. It's a result of his relationship to it. Verse 17. Now keep in mind, Jesus is speaking before the cross, so it is not fully complete. He's at the onset of his, at his uh, ministry, so he is still kind of in the process of fulfilling all of this, but he says this about his his purpose. Do you not think, or do not think I've come to abolish the law? I didn't come to throw out the school system and say, hey, that's just all messed up. I didn't come to say that the law is bad and throw it out saying that there's, there's, there's no place for that in the world anymore. I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Now, fulfilling is very different because fulfilling actually upholds the value of it, doesn't it? You go, Christ goes through a system highlights the value of that. He, that's, he wouldn't do anything that's not good. He wouldn't subject himself to sin. That's not sin, as we'll get to next week or next time, right? It's, it's valuable. It's good. But he went through and he fulfilled all of it. I came to fulfill them. Ceremonial, the civil, the moral laws, all of them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, for you guys, for us, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees who are doing this perfectly, who are meticulous in obeying the letter of the law, unless it surpasses those, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What's he saying? He's saying, you have two options here. Go through the course yourself or let me fulfill it for you. That's the summation of his life. When he fulfilled it, it was like he took on the program, said, you can't do it. I know you can't, and you're going to be a dropout every time. I'm going to do it for you. So that way, when the school or when the law or the system comes and said, hey, by the way, you, 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 know, you have to follow these rules. Like, well, wait a minute. I graduated. Talbot has no more say on whether I dance or drink or how I dress. Cal Poly has no more say on my schedule or calendar. My junior college went to has no more say. Why? Because I've completed it. The law has no more say because Christ completed it. It has no more say. It has no more authority over you. You say, well, but it talks here about, about observing and keeping and so forth. What's that like? What's the relationship of that all about? That's an important conversation to have. What does it look like for us to be, to, to reflect what Christ is, is saying here? Let me first say this really quickly. How do I know that it is done with? Because the law was there to, to um, bridge the gap or to maintain that relationship that I had with God because of the temple's curtain's been torn in half. Remember that event? Torn in half? Now I can go and boldly approach the throne of grace. And even if I have unclean hands or I'm a little bit dirty on the outside or if I, uh, if I, I had a little bit of a sin problem, whatnot, guess what? The curtain's still open. The curtain's still open, right? Even if I, I didn't brush my teeth after I ate that shrimp cocktail and so I still have a little fish breath on me, I can still approach. I can still approach because it's wide open. 
before the curtain was there to keep you away, to keep you out. And if you didn't have all the right ceremonial things, you couldn't approach God. But now it's wide open, and that's the evidence or the validation. So, but Jesus, though, brings up something here about, but there's something still kind of a relationship you have to it all, right? There's still, so, there still seems some kind of, what does that look like? Here's the number, second point of that. It's not in your notes, but you can write it down. It's like this. Next slide. It instructs us about the relationship we already have. It's a good way of thinking about it. It has no authority over you, but it does instruct you about the relationship you already have. You've already got the relationship. Oh, and maybe another way of saying this, you've already got the righteousness. You're already righteous. Nobody who is unrighteous approaches God. Nobody who's unrighteous has a relationship with God. That's a, that's a fact. Because God is holy and righteous and good and no unclean thing will approach him. The fact that the curtain is torn in two and you have relationship with him means that you are righteous. You already are righteous. What the law, what the Old Testament does is it instructs us in kind of the nature of what that is, the nuances of that relationship, the nuances of that righteousness, what it looks like. It informs us, helps us understand it because let's be honest, we're, we're all, hey, I'm in Christ, but what does that mean? Right? See, God infuses you, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 4, or I think it's verse 5, he gives you, he pours into you his joy, his spirit, his love, right? He has poured his love into your hearts, and now he's going to grow in understanding what that is. Understanding the magnitude of his love for you. And one of the places that we do look to understand that relationship that's already ours is we do look to the Old Testament, because the Old Testament, the law especially, informs us about what the cross really did. I mean, why the cross? Well, okay, my sin. Well, why the cross? What did it really do? Well, if you read Leviticus, you see that there's, there's, there's a problem in which there is a very important process that God is approached by. And there's blood sacrifices required for people's and nations' sin. And there's a sacrifice day in and day out because God is angry. And if people don't keep doing the sacrifices to keep that, that wrath at bay, then they are exiled. They, are, they, they don't get prosperity. They, they are killed because there's a very real reciprocal relationship between sin and wrath. You sin and there's wrath. Well, how do I, a sinner, ever think of avoiding the wrath of God? Well, here's a gracious system for you that doesn't remove the sin, but it's a shadow of the one who will. And you keep doing this because you have trust in what I'm going to be doing in him. So you understand the nature of the cross when you look at the sacrifice in the back going, oh my, that was a shadow. That was giving me kind of blueprints or, or a little, little uh, like the shadow is what that, the silhouette of what's to come. Priests. Jesus was the great high priest. You don't approach God on your own. You don't say, hey, it's today, it's just Tim and God day. No, you approach him in Christ. He is the mediator between God and man, the only mediator. Nobody comes to God on their own volition or decision. They come because Christ did something. Well, how do I know that? Because in the Old Testament, there was this priest system that God said, no, you don't come into my presence. Only one time a year a high priest will come. Oh, okay, so I have to have a mediator. See, you looked at that to understand the significance about that relationship. Even about the nuances. It instructs us. Let's turn to one instructing place that Paul gives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now the book of 1 Corinthians is really a group of people who have done it really poorly. They're abusing the grace of God. License to sin. Paul, starting in chapter 8, is really kind of bringing up an issue that was becoming very common in Corinth. Let me tell you a bit about that issue. So there were lots of deities and temples and gods in the, in the city of Corinth. Now, not real gods, we get that right, but, but idols and so forth. And that area, that nation or that, that group of people, what they would, the practice was, very similar to the Old Testament in this one, but is they would have these temples and attached to the shrine temple, there was a restaurant. 
So what you would do is if you had a prosperous harvest, you got a lot of wheat that year, or your, your lambs really reproduced a lot, so you got an abundant amount of lambs, or your kid had their 13th birthday and became a man, you want to celebrate that, or you get your son or daughter got engaged, you want to celebrate that engagement. You want to celebrate and say, thank you, God of harvest, or God of marriage, or God of whatever it was, for how you have blessed our family. You bring in your fattened calf, you sacrifice it in honor to God, and then you go to the restaurant next door, and you celebrate with a meal in honor of the God. And you invite all your friends around. Hey, come celebrate with us. Killing the fattened calf. Lots of food for everybody. Man. Well, your, your next door neighbor invites you to come. You're a, you're a devout Christian. Well, I, I know that those idols are really nothing. There's only one God in heaven. There's no, there's no really such thing as, as these idols. They're nothing. And, and gosh, and It'd be so much fun to enjoy that. I mean, they're really rich and they have a lot of money and they can feed us really well. It'd be great to have shrimp cocktail again. Yeah, I like shrimp cocktail. <laughs> I do. So you go. And Paul's starting in chapter 8, going through chapter really 10, even dipping into 11, but really chapter 10. Paul is addressing that scenario. Oh, you're very true in saying that idols are nothing. We get that. Idols are nothing. And you're right in saying that you're not under law, so you are free to go. I mean, the law is not binding. You're you're free to go in that sense, right? But look what he says in chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 14. He says after kind of describing this, Therefore, my beloved, free from idolatry, we'll get to how he says that, free from idolatry, go into those temples, celebrate the people, right? I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not? Now, that's a communion cup, Lord's Supper that we partake in. They did it about every Sunday. We do it once a month here. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Yeah, absolutely it is. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but is Christ living in me? Participating, celebrating him in that meal. He is the deity that we are celebrating, right? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Absolutely it is. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. What? But I'm a Christian. I don't look at that part of the Bible anymore. No, no, no. Let's go back there, right? Let's let's look back into the first five books and watch the people of Israel, what goes on with them. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? This is drawing on the book of Leviticus. You bring your burnt offering to the Lord. They sacrifice in honor of him. And then what do you do at that? You have a big feast with your family and friends. You invite them over and you eat the meat of the sacrifice. Those who eat the meat, are they not participating also in the altar? The structure? Oh yeah. Participation. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that idols is anything? No, not at all. Those are nothing. Food is neutral. Wood is neutral. Brick is neutral. Right? But there's meaning attached to those structures. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons. That changes the nature of the conversation. They offer to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? See how he goes back to the Old Testament? Well, let's, let's I mean, he didn't, he didn't go to the new. He didn't say, he said, let's just look at Israel. Here's an example. Let's instruct you about the nuances of the nature of the relationship you already have. He didn't say, hey, if you do this, you guys are not Christians. But he's warning them. He's kind of warning them. I don't want you participating with demons. Right? Okay. I think you're seeing where I'm going. Before we leave 1 Corinthians, go back to verse, chapter 9, verse 19. Because all of this raises a certain issue in our heart and mind. Well, if, so that instructs me. So, is that all it does? Does it just instruct me? So what really is the binding rule for life? Is there anything binding? Is it just free? I'm in Christ, and I can just really do what I like. And He spoke all about love. I do all I want about love. Is there anything binding on me? Well, absolutely there is. Chapter 9, verse 19. Paul is talking about his freedom in Christ. For though I am free, he says, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Notice the motivation. 
Win them to who? To Christ. To the Jew I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law. Though not being myself under the law, but I became like them, right? I make sure I eat the right foods around them. I, I am circumcised, you know, so that's a benefit for him. But notice he also, Timothy, his companion, Timothy wasn't circumcised. His dad was a Greek, his mom was a Jew, wasn't circumcised. When they go off into, uh, where'd they go? I forget the city, but they were going to go and minister to an area highly populated, I think it was Ephesus, populated by Jews. So what does Paul do? He has Timothy circumcised. Wait a minute, Galatians, he says, if you let yourself be circumcised, then the Christ is nothing to you. What are you doing, Paul? Hypocrisy. No. See, he's becoming like those under the law to reach those under the law, not because he feels he has to become under the law, but to reach them. So I become like them, though I myself are not a part of that. So circumcised to become pleasing to God, or if you're doing something to become pleasing to God, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. You are pleasing to God if you're in Christ. So he says, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law, that is the Jews. To those outside the law, the Gentiles, I became as one outside the law. Not, now here's a parenthetical, not being outside the law of God, of course, so I don't partake in all of the crazy idolatrous stuff out there and, you know, sexual orgies and drunkenness, right? I'm not outside of God's law, but under the law of Christ. So there's a God's law that's different than the law, Mosaic law, and he defines it as the law of Christ. The law of Christ. When we talk about the law of Christ, I mean, we can really boil it down into a couple statements that sort of govern, but it isn't totally perfect in that, but I guess it governs. You love God, and that's really about it, to be honest, because the second commandment is like it, but not it. That's the first and greatest. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second's like it. It's not it. It's second, kind of like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Basically, we might summarize that second one down to, and I wrote it here. Where did I put it? Um, I'll find it someday. Yeah, I'll find it someday. But basically, love others out of the reflection of your love for God. So that's because the number one is greater, you let that govern the second one as well. That's why the Great Commission is almost the greatest fulfillment of those two because you are loving people to Christ. You are loving them not for the sake of love, but for the sake of them knowing Jesus. And you're helping them love God. And that also governs the nature of your love for them because it makes sure that you're keeping the boundaries of my love for God. I don't throw out my love for God to love other people. Some do. Well, I can do what I want. Just gotta love people. That's all God wants. Well, no, no. You love God first, and for out of that love for God, you love other people. That's important. Understanding this, understanding this is essential for us to understand the nature of our relationship to the Old Testament, to the Mosaic Law. Because Christ didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. And now Paul says, I'm not under the law of Moses, but under the law of Christ. There's that belonging to another. But what does that look like? I use it to instruct me about this relationship. But what are those laws like? Well, it's love God and love others. Well, Tim, party foul here. Let me just throw this out to you, okay? Because I, let me just take first person here. Let's say I live a homosexual lifestyle. I love God immensely. I love Jesus. I follow him. And I believe that he has sanctified my homosexuality. See, let me just say this, that all the, co the commandments in the scriptures, the dietary laws, the, the clothing laws are all about loving God. Those moral laws a lot of times are about loving each other. But this is where we get a little bit of a confusion. How, how do we deal with, with that? Because really, I'm loving people. I'm loving somebody. And I love Jesus. And I'm not quite sure how this one fits. In fact, it seems like it's sanctified by that law of Christ. The way that we respond to this is not to go back to the Old Testament. We're not under the law of Moses. We look at what Jesus says. Now, Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, you might jot it down if you haven't, don't know about it already, but it's having a conversation about divorce. In that, he affirms what marriage is 
is in God's mind. Do you not know that in the beginning God made them male and female? There's two kinds of people that God made. After a little bit more conversation, he says, therefore, a man will leave his mother and father, quoting Genesis, and he'll become one flesh. Thus showing God's design for marriage, right? Now, he's affirming the sanctity of that union, not other unions. I mean, we can talk about other unions. Bestiality, that's not sanctified, right? Well, yeah, but the Old Testament's passe. We don't deal with that anymore. Okay, one, he affirmed it in Matthew chapter 19. But then, in the application of all that, we see Paul drawing on that marriage Ephesians chapter 5, marriage picture, the same way the Jews did, in which it's a picture of the relationship of Christ and the church. Two different kinds of people becoming one. So you start looking at the context of marriage, which is why anything outside of that, why Paul in similar texts, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and in even 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, he says that homosexuality is outside of that design. Because it doesn't model, it's like Christ marrying Christ, that's not the purpose, or a human marrying a human, that's not the purpose. It's the human being, one kind, marrying another kind, uniting themselves and becoming one flesh. And because of that union, of what it signifies, and even Paul says in Ephesians 5, that this mystery is really pointing not to this love mystery of how people come together, but of Christ and the church. That's the mystery being portrayed in this relationship. So you move into the New Testament, which does prohibit that, but it presents a fuller picture of the purpose which God has for that marriage union and helps you see that that union is outside of that picture. Are you seeing in some ways that you let the love for God, if I love, I love God, I want, I want to model God, image God to the world, and when somebody in a homoerotic way gets involved, they are now imaging what they want to image and not God. Marriage was sanctified by God because it models, it models his character and his relationship that he wants with humanity. That's the point. So it very much is in line with the law of Christ. Every other law, I look in the Old Testament, what about dietary and, and uh, whatever? Hey, I'm clothed in Christ. I approach the throne with the clothes of Christ, of Christ, right? Mark chapter seven, all food is clean. Jesus declares all food is clean, which is why now you can actually have fellowship and eat at the table of other, other nationalities and other cultures because anything that they bring to the table, you can enjoy with full gladness of heart because all food, no, nothing's unclean. Are you seeing kind of how the discernment takes place? It's instructive for us, but our law is a law of Christ, what he lays out for us. And again, notice, he gives you the righteousness and then he calls you to live it. Live out the fulfilled righteousness that I've given to you. That's the order in which it comes, which is described here in our text in Romans chapter 7. He says, you have died through the body of Christ uh, so that you might belong to another. Now look at the bottom of verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 4. The bottom of it, he says, in order that we may bear fruit for God. In order that we may bear fruit for God. You do realize that bearing fruit is kind of the culmination of that relationship. It's the maturation of it all. It's what God is looking for, the fruit to him. That key word there is to, fruit to God, in which it's not so much, oh, okay, something's happening to me, but it's even more of, God, this is done in your behalf. This is done for your glory. This is done to you. And so the change that is happening starts off with the love affair we have with the world, moving that to the love affair we have with the Lord. That's the direction. So you belong to another so you might bear fruit to God. Now you notice the pronoun in this sentence change. You were bound to the law, now you're bound to Christ so that we, as the new pronoun there, might bear fruit to him. Because so much of this fruit bearing is a communal thing. God doesn't save you to be a silo in the desert. It doesn't save you to be sanctified. Your sanctification requires community involvement. Because the commands of Christ, love requires other people to express love. You don't love people if you're just at home all the time and not around anybody. You're not offering gentleness to somebody if you're never around them. 
So he moves us into we now, because of this union, can share with him. And here's the hard part. We don't always see the transformation. We still see the strife take place. We still see the impurity in our hearts, don't we? I mean, we get discouraged and Satan says, you see, you haven't been transformed by Christ. Oh my goodness, we're past the time. My apologies. Let me just give this one quick analogy. My, my bad. Kids in the back, my bad. Okay. I just, I just didn't look at the clock. Last, I won't go to the slide, but here's, write this down. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. See, we don't see ourselves changing. Just like I don't see my son change every day I pick him up in the morning. But if I pull out a photograph of my son when he was born and now, there's a big drastic change, isn't there? If you look at yourself 20 years ago, a photograph, and a photograph today, or a picture of yourself today, they're very different, right? But you'll wake up tomorrow and see that nothing's changed. Uh, you know, uh, not, I still look the same. When you get those two photographs, my goodness, how much have I changed? So this is where we need to start saying, Lord, how have you been changing me? How, let me? Let me look at the process that you have been doing work in me in changing, because that union with you is going to change me. It's going to bear fruit to God. It's going to bear fruit in relationship. Let's start taking notice of that, lest we get discouraged. And lest the Satan is allowed to come in and say, you see, you are a bad follower of the law. See, in all of this, you are sprinkled with the blood of Christ, which is why those things that require death in the Old Testament, Christ to a woman who is caught in adultery says, neither do I condemn you, now go and sin no more. Adultery was punishable by death, condemned by death, and Jesus says, go and sin no more. Lest we are being judged ourselves, let ourselves be judged by the law, we have got to make sure we take notice of how God, by his Spirit's power, is transforming our hearts and bearing fruit to God. And we do that by allowing ourselves to see over spans of time at times. So it's really hard to see when we're looking day to day. I'm gonna call the band up here. I apologize. I want to, I feel so bad. I feel so bad about this because I'm, I really want to have, here, so, so play away. You guys stay as long as you want. If you want to get your kids, you can do that, but worship with us and, and go to your kids and bring them in this room, okay? Let's do it that way. Let me close in prayer. God, thank you so much how you have loved us and given us your son. Thank you so much for, for the new relationship we have with Christ and how we are separate from the law. We do, that is not our authority or our dictator. Lord, we look to that because your words were spoken and it instructs us, but all in the context of Christ. You fulfilled it and we filter it through you. And let us see you in every part of the scripture. Let us see you in everything that we do and manifest you to the world that they may see and know you as you really are. So I pray these things in your name. Amen.